Hello, this is Craig Brausford with Redshift Companies. Thank you for joining today's event with Genetic Technologies Limited, which trades on the NASDAQ under the ticker GENE and on the Australian Stock Exchange under the ticker GTG. With us today, we have Peter Rubenstein, Chairman of Genetic Technologies, as well as other members of the management team. We will begin with a brief presentation in a moment, and then we will answer your questions. Users may submit a question at any time by using the Q&A tool at the bottom of the Zoom window. Before we begin, please allow me to read the Safe Harbor Statement. This call may contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. All statements pertaining to future financial and or operating results, along with other statements about the future expectations, beliefs, goals, plans, or prospects expressed by management, constitute forward-looking statements. Any statements that are not historical facts should also be considered forward-looking statements. Of course, forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties. I now turn this webinar over to the Genetic Technologies team. Please go ahead. Thank you, and uh, thanks to uh, to Redship. Uh, Genetic Technologies uh, is a company that's uh, dual listed on the uh, ASX and on NASDAQ, and um, we've been around for uh, for 20 years. Uh, we're a leader in the uh, personalized genomic space, having uh, completed recently uh, a suite of tests that really cover the, the general population and assess their risk of serious disease. So we'll take you through a, uh, a short presentation and then open up to, to questions. The market opportunity for genomics is, is quite staggering, and uh, over the last a uh, few years, uh, you've seen a, a large uh, uptake in the um, family history type use of, of genomics, as well as for rare diseases. And now we're moving into that space where we are using genomics to assist the, the general population in helping them to stay healthy, to, uh, to achieve preventative measures uh, for some of the major serious diseases. And uh, if you look at this slide, you can see how large the uh, the addressable market is and the growth in, in genomics over the next few years. There is uh, a, a lot of uh, competition in the genomics space, but in terms of where genetic technologies is sitting, we are fairly uniquely placed. And um, I will be uh, turning over to a little uh, clip from Dr. Joel Evans, who's the head of the Functional Medicine Institute in the United States, to talk a little bit about um, where he sees our technology sitting. But if you look at this uh, slide, you can see that the combination of medical tests and clinically actionable regulatory approved tests in relation to genomics, we're, we're sitting way out to the right on our own. And uh, I'm just going to ask the red chip team to play a little clip uh, from Dr. Joel Evans. I am incredibly optimistic about the opportunity. And I think that two things have happened fairly recently. Um, number one is the opportunities in the conventional practitioner space where this concept of polygenic risk is now beginning to have some real momentum. And, you know, Erica was just at a big meeting at the Menopause Society and was shocked that one of their main presentations was on something called the Wisdom Trial, which is about polygenic risk. And as you know, polygenic risk is really exciting, and it's about how we utilize genes to predict risk. But gene type takes polygenic risk and does one better, right? We take the polygenic risk and combine it with different personalized factors to get a personalized risk, which is more accurate and better than just pure polygenic risk. And so polygenic risk is now just taking the conventional medicine world by storm. There's Eric Topol, who is head of the Scripps Clinic in San Diego, 
professor at Stanford, editor-in-chief of Medscape. He just came out in February saying that polygenic risk has to be a routine part of regular medical care. So we're starting to see momentum and excitement in the conventional medical space. And then I'm in the functional space, which, you know, is sort of an... Thank you. I'll just uh, share my screen again. So as you can see, uh, Dr. Joel Evans uh, is a, um, a leading uh, practitioner in the functional medicine space. And he has uh, been a, a big supporter of our gene type multi-risk test and can really see the opportunity that it, it can really impact lives uh, in the United States and that the market is now ready uh, to adopt these sorts of tests. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Erica Spaeth, who uh, Joel mentioned in his clip. And Erica is going to just talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that we're seeing in the United States around some of the larger uh, B2B uh, initiatives um, that will allow us to uh, leverage off the uh, the scale and the pipeline that we've created to be able to to get our test into the market at scale and provide practitioners and their patients with seamless access to both in, inputting the data required, um, managing the the sample, which is just a simple cheek swab, and then getting access to the results. So I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Erica now. Thanks, Peter. So I guess I'll touch on a few of the different commercial channels that we are engaging with. We have what Joel mentioned, we we do have channels into sort of the traditional medicine landscape through OBGYNs and primary care physicians, concierge medicine, and then also the functional medicine space. And these providers order the test for their patients. Uh, directly within their clinics. And a lot of the telehealth practices that are growing quite a bit in this space are able to order the test and then ship them off to their patients. So we're able to reach more patients through the telehealth channels that physicians have themselves, as well as leverage our own telehealth network. So we've partnered with a telehealth group. And so we are able to offer testing to people who come onto our website and this is enabling our commercial partnerships with groups like WellWorks and Stay Healthy and Know Your Lemons and other larger employers um, where they can offer the testing to their employees through wellness programs that they initiate over the course of a year. And the patients or the employees themselves can come directly to our platform, order the test through a third-party telehealth network um, the results then go back to the patient and can be reviewed by the telehealth party. And one of the partners in our more streamlined process that we've created is Nest. And Nest Genomics is enabling the communication between a provider and a patient and can enable a provider to give a care plan to the patient. So while gene type itself is, is a single test, the resulting care plan will manage that patient over the coming years in terms of the screening plan, the surveillance plan, lifestyle changes, and even medications for certain diseases. And that's all enabled through this backend platform that we are associated with. Thanks, Erica. Uh, excellent overview. I'll um, now just want to touch on this uh, this important slide, which is an overview of where the business is at today, and how we've moved from having a uh, a burn of close to eight hundred thousand dollars a month down to closer to two to three hundred. Um, and given the given the market conditions at the moment with the capital markets, it's it's a very challenging time to raise capital for small cap listed companies, uh, especially in the biotech space. So just want to give a quick overview. Um, 
uh, up the top, we've got our easy DNA and affinity platforms, which are resellers of paternity, animal health and, and general health and wellness tests. Uh, it's generating uh, over $7 million in, in revenue and it's uh, they're both profitable businesses. They are marketplaces uh, covering uh, up to 40 countries. Then on the, the right hand side, we've got our gene type uh, platform, which we've invested uh, over $50 million uh, over the past 10 years uh, in developing a suite of tests. We started out with the breast cancer test uh, back in 2012. Uh, that had uh, seven SNPs and we published the first paper on polygenic risk score back in 2012. Now there are hundreds of papers being published and our test covers uh, nine indications now, about 70% of all mortality and morbidity in one saliva-based test. And then we add that uh, medical history or the clinical risk component to give people a truly comprehensive assessment of their risk on that individualized basis. Now, the gene type uh, product, when we started out in 2012, the, the breast cancer test alone was $3,000 for one test. And uh, now we're selling the, uh, the test for $350 for the, for the entire package. Uh, which goes up to $500 for all nine uh, different disease categories. So the costs have come down. The market awareness has gone up dramatically through numerous publications. And then groups that are in the consumer-based genetics area that are looking at family history and, and genealogy, uh, they're starting to uh, entice people to see that genetics is more than just family history and more than just rare diseases, that everybody has a, uh, a footprint of, um, you know, what, of their, their genomic, genetic uh, predispositions. And we now have the opportunity to utilize that data for um, future management of diseases that we know that one in two people will suffer during their lifetime. So what we're looking to do now is with the, with the gene type platform, there are two pathways to market, and one is through our Easy DNA and Affinity platform, which is a direct-to-consumer or CIT type approach where the consumer can initiate the sales process, but a doctor needs to be um, in, in the process to receive the results. And those results can either be provided by your own doctor or by through telehealth through a doctor that we provide. And then that starts that actionable pathway. So the other part of the business that um, we've launched recently is the oncology or precision oncology business, which will also uh, use the back end of the easy DNA and affinity platforms to allow doctors to have a doctor's only portal to order tests. Some of those tests are reimbursable through, through Medicare, and uh, that will also allow doctors to order the, the multi-risk test. If we look at the, the bottom three boxes there, principally over the last 10 years, we've done all our R&D in-house and we've been working with um, some very preeminent institutes across the globe uh, in, in partnership. Uh, we've now made a decision that we're going to outsource our laboratory activities in terms of running the wet lab component of the gene type test. And what that means is we can now move to a laboratory that is a high throughput lab that can do 100,000 tests per month, um, which is a significant increase, maybe 50-fold increase to what we've been able to do in our lab in, in uh, Melbourne. The, uh, the lab that we've outsourced to is based in Houston. It's, it's close to our uh, near-term addressable market uh, in the United States, and it really gives us an opportunity to get the the results and the information back to um, practitioners and patients quicker and at a lower cost. So we're we're really excited about that relationship, and the the R and D activities are now being we we're utilizing some of the external laboratory work that some of our partners have been involved in over the years. So that's also a way that we can start to commercialize some of these opportunities on behalf of those institutes. And that is a, a work in progress. And our commercial partnerships with groups like WellWorks and Stay Healthy and 
other institutes uh, are starting to to bear fruit where we are now accessing uh, assessing the the ability to uh, interact with millions of uh, employees through uh, payers and through different charities and organizations where they have direct relationships uh, groups like uh, we announced recently cancer iq where they have a million patients on their system all relating to uh, cancer-based activities with 250 um, clinics and 250 hospitals in their network. It's a really elegant way where information flows are seamless and it makes it much easier for practitioners and for consumers to engage with our, with our tests. And then lastly, um, Erica touched on some of the pipeline partnerships to provide that scale and groups like uh, NEST and, and DNA Nexus uh, allow us to have a pipeline that is really elegant, that is uh, state of the art in terms of managing data, the security of the data, the HIPAA compliance and, and the ability to scale. And it's, it's a really, I think, exciting time for the company to be able to offer our tests at scale with confidence for a practitioner based uh, test. So the difference between our test and a lot of the other tests that are out there is we are a medical grade test that is clinically validated and regulatory approved. We have uh, clear accreditation in, in the States and NATA accreditation in Australia. And it is um, a fairly unique proposition as, as uh, Dr. Joel Evans mentioned before, that combination of genetics and an individual's personal medical history makes our test truly unique. I'm just uh, going to move down to. Um, so it's been a it's been a long journey, as as you can see, in terms of uh, where we've come from. Back, you know, being involved in the Human Genome Project uh, 19 years ago. But if you look here, there are, you know, some really elegant products that we're offering in those two different uh, buckets, the marketplace of the easy DNA, and then the gene type uh, products, which are really medical grade products. And you can see there the areas that, that we're covering. Uh, once we're selling the gene type test through our own uh, easy DNA platform, the margins will increase to over 70%. And as I mentioned, the, the oncology tests will, in the areas of um, actually uh, looking at at cancers themselves and providing reports back to specialists around uh, treatment options. As you can see, our test covers nine different indications. Uh, it's now a, a buckle swab. The cost of um, manufacturing the test has dropped dramatically. Uh, we've got a, a cheaper collection device, a, a cheaper packaging system, a lower cost means of getting the product um, to the consumer and back. And it's really going to allow us to, to sell this test at a, at a very attractive price point. And given that it covers such a wide range of serious diseases, it's, it's really quite unique and, and quite uh, an attractive offering. So we're now uh, at a point where we've uh, been going for 20 minutes. Uh, the company is um, looking for some uh, strategic uh, investors at the moment as, as cornerstones. Uh, about 70% of our stock is held in the United States, about 30% in Australia. And we are really at, at the cusp of generating some, uh, I guess, significant interest from those B2B uh, opportunities. Uh, it does take time and uh, time uh, unfortunately costs money in, in this area. So we do need to go back to the markets occasionally to to raise capital and we're, we're in that uh, position at the moment. So I will um, hand back now to the uh, Redchip team and uh, open up for questions. Thank you very much for that presentation, Peter. Please use the Q and A uh, button. Click on that Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and submit your question by typing it in to the text box. We'll read it aloud, and then Peter and his colleagues will answer it. 
give everyone a moment to think of any questions for the team. Peter, how does genetic technology's gene type test differentiate compared to traditional risk assessment tests on the market? I might uh, hand over to Erica to uh, to answer that question. It's uh, it's a very common question, and and we have uh, I think a very uh, clear answer to that. Yep. So I guess there are two different risk assessment tests that are on the market. Um, one, there's in doctors' offices, they ask about family history. That's a risk assessment, and we have done side by side comparisons showing that our risk models adding more risk factors, we outperform basic questionnaires. Um, for some diseases, there are risk models that have more questions. And again, we've also done side-by-side -side comparisons showing that adding a polygenic risk score outperforms the gold standard models. So there's that type of risk assessment. And then there are risk assessments that exist from the hereditary cancer standpoint. And that is like a BRCA1, a BRCA gene panel, for example. And those tests are very different from what we offer. A, a BRCA test or a, a gene, a hereditary gene panel for a specific cancer or a group of cancers addresses about 1% of the population. Our test addresses the other 99% of the population. So they are different target markets and they're addressing different types of risk. I'll just uh, jump in there. We have launched our uh, HBOC plus test, which uh, combines the, the BRCA gene with the uh, polygenic risk score test and the clinical risk. So that truly gives a, a comprehensive uh, risk assessment. That test was launched back in uh, May in California with uh, uh, Angelina Jolly's breast surgeon at the uh, at the event, and it was very well received. So that really provides a comprehensive um, opportunity for risk assessment. Uh, Angelina Jolly had uh, the BRCA gene, and it was very prominent. Uh, but only one in twenty women who get breast cancer have got the BRCA gene. The other nineteen um, don't have that ability to understand what their risk was. Two out of 20 will have uh, a family history, but 17 out of 20 or 85% are sporadic. And half of those women, had they been given our test prior to onset of that cancer, would have been notified that they were high risk and they could have taken some you know, different actionable pathways uh, that may have caught that disease earlier and, and may have had an impact on uh, on future um, uh, treatments. Back to you, Richard. What is the target audience for genetic technology gene type tests? I know you alluded to this before, but if you could shed a little more light on that. Uh, I see the target audience as uh, anybody over the age of 30 that doesn't have a, uh, a pre-existing condition. It is a it is truly a massive market opportunity that has not been addressed by any other product out there. And that combination of genetics and personalized medical history is truly unique. We have 25 patents covering that combination and our individual tests, and we are really well placed to, to uh, have dramatic increase in, uh, in appeal for our test. We've done some work on um, influencer campaigns and, and uh, direct, you know, email campaigns. And we feel that a combination of our, you know, uh, B2B activities with the practitioner networks, as well as starting to target some consumers that are interested in their own personalized health through functional medicine and, and preventative health clinics, there's a real combination of uh, approaches to get this uh, test into the market. And just to add a little bit of extra clarity on there, if you if you were to divide up the population, as Peter's right, anybody over 30 is appropriate for our test. But why is that? If we could divide up the population into three stages of screening, um, the pre-screening age, so adults over 30, but who aren't eligible yet for standard screening. So if you think about mammography or colonoscopies, a 30 year old's too young to get those. But if you risk assess them, they might enter that screening pathway sooner. Then you have screening age adults who are eligible for screening programs, but we have compliance issues 
um, and there might be more frequent screening or even less frequent screening available. And the only way to know is to risk assess. And then the third bucket is screening cessation. So we are starting to live longer and screening guidelines disappear starting at around between 70 and 74. And so to be able to risk assess in an older population to see what tests, what screening they should continue with versus not, risk assessment is also a, a tool for that setting. What is the sensitivity and specificity of the test? And what is the total number tested year to date? Also, will you be at ASCO in 2025? I might uh, hand over to, uh, to Erica to answer that. Yeah, so in risk assessment, we traditionally don't use sensitivity and specificity to, to measure the, the clinical accuracy of the test. This is a risk prediction. We use other statistical metrics to, to look at the performance. Uh, we look at area under the curve, uh, calibration, um, net reclassification. So those are the statistical metrics that we look at. And again, when we compare our risk assessment to gold standards, we outperform the gold standards using each of those statistical metrics. The Erica, the, yeah. Erica the, um, the number of people that we have utilized in uh, creating our tests in terms of sample data, how does that compare with a standard clinical trial? We, we have been able to access large cohort data. So we've We've accessed through our own R&D and through external groups who've done R&D on the same subject to just bolster the, the clinical data that exists are hundreds of thousands of patients that we've been able to observe over 10 year periods of time to look at cancer and disease incidence rate to show that we are good at predicting disease incidents over a period of time compared to a gold standard. Thank you. What are, oh, thank, thank you very much. What are some of the patents held by genetic technologies? Yeah, some of the, the patents relate to um, the combination of genomic data and clinical risk. So that combination of an individual's personal medical history combined with their genetic data, uh, that forms part of our patent series. And we also have patents relating to the specific indications uh, for each of the, uh, you know, the different disease candidates that we, that we have. So we have a different, uh, a number of different approaches to uh, protecting the, the landscape. And as I've mentioned, we have spent, uh, millions of dollars, and it, it may be getting close to $10 million just on patent costs uh, over the uh, the history of our involvement with uh, genetic testing. Yeah, and just to follow up, will you be at that ASCO or American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting in 2025? Yes, I. Uh, we we attend every year, so I will be there personally. How does genetic technologies plan to drive revenue growth for its easy DNA and affinity DNA brands? Excellent. Um, easy DNA and affinity are, are marketplaces, and uh, we have that those businesses. Uh, easy DNA has been around for seventeen years, uh, led by Kevin Camilleri, based in in Malta, and um, we we have a I guess a long history of being able to choose. Uh, really uh, viable test products that are uh, of interest to the market. Uh, so we, we pick great tests and uh, we have very um, good good pricing. Uh, part of the the approach to um, generating traffic there is is the standard um, you know payment for you know online activities uh, generating traffic in that way. But we do have hundreds of thousands of um, past users of, of the sites and we're starting to, to re-interact with them. But we are very well known for our uh, paternity tests, both for the consumer and the legal uh, application of paternity tests. So um, we're, we're a fairly well-known brand in the marketplace. Peter, how is genetic technologies expanding its global footprint? 
Uh, great question. Um, the the pipeline that we've created and the ability to uh, to run tests in uh, wet labs anywhere in the world allows us to really uh, protect our core IP, which is the algorithm that interprets the uh, the data and the uh, SNP panels that we have um, customized uh, for our own use. So what we're able to do is to set up a wet lab anywhere in the world. So if we wanted to uh, to move into China and the Chinese government said uh, DNA samples shouldn't leave the country, we could set up a wet lab in Hong Kong and uh, then run those uh, that data across our algorithm and then present the results back to the practitioners. So we're talking to a number of uh, different groups in, in different countries, uh, whether that's um, UAE or Italy, and um, we're starting to to get some real interest because the uh, the cost of creating this type of pipeline and, and this type of technology would cost tens and tens of millions of dollars. And these markets and these other jurisdictions are really ripe uh, for the opportunity where groups have got the relationships with this, with the practitioners and with the consumers that they can leverage off. We can just easily slot in to those existing channels and um, provide the opportunity for these tests to be offered all around the world. Who can order the tests? Is this physician or nurse practitioner directed? How are the results presented? Uh, I'll I'll uh, hand over to uh, to Erica to answer this, but it's a really elegant system that allows for both a consumer and a doctor to to order the tests, and we've designed it so that uh, it works equally well for for both. So, Erica, over to you. Yeah. So the the order has to be signed off by a, a licensed healthcare provider. Um, who orders a test? Very slightly by state because each state has different regulations on on what a healthcare provide which type of healthcare provider can order what type of test, um, and then the results are presented as absolute risk scores. So there is a percentage on the front page for the patient's personal risk over a certain period of time, and then subsequent pages help explain that risk. We have a section about a polygenic risk. We have a section about the clinical risk factors. And then we list all the available guidelines around that disease and the screening and risk reduction guidelines that exist in the space. So the healthcare provider can have a joint decision-making discussion with their patient. So at this point in time, anybody can order the test, but it needs to have a practitioner sign off on that order. So somebody can pay for the test and then their practitioner can uh, has to be part of the process because we're giving people information about their risk of cancer and that needs to be presented in a uh, in a fashion that, that uh, comes with it, the appropriate uh, medical insights. Final question. How does genetic technologies ensure the privacy and security of personal health data? We have secure systems that we use to store all of our data within our, our laboratory information management system, but we also partner with a group called DNA Nexus for all of our uh, analysis processes and reporting, and they have a secure system as well. Um, and we do not sell data as well. So we keep all of the data in-house on, on secure systems within our own infrastructure or within our, our partner providers. Thank you very much. Peter, um, I'll just allow you and possibly other members of your team to wrap up with some final thoughts. Maybe you'd like to give us the essential value proposition. Why should an investor be interested in genetic technologies right now? One in two people will suffer from a serious disease in their lifetime, and our test covers 70% of those diseases, those serious diseases. And uh, I think if you asked anybody who got cancer, if they wish they could have caught it earlier. And I think you know what the answer would have been. And really 
we're about helping people to um, catch disease earlier and uh, even leading to, to prevention. So the test has incredible utility and uh, our market cap in the States is uh, under 5 million US dollars for a test that's had uh, over $50 million spent on it. It is uh, an incredible uh, opportunity to uh, to be part of uh, a technology platform that really has the opportunity to to change people's lives for the better. And uh, we believe that genetics is now coming into the the foray um, in uh, Australia recently. Um, insurers have been banned from using genetic information to price <coughs> life insurance policies. So that's now a, uh, a hurdle that's been removed. Uh, that was a hurdle as to why people didn't want to take genetic tests. But remember that only about two and a half percent of the population have genetic mutations. The rest of the population don't have the ability to use genetics for risk prediction or, or determining their, their real health position from, from the genetics without utilizing a test like ours. And given that we combine it with clinical risk factors, with that personal medical history, it's truly a unique selling proposition and it's it's only a matter of time. So um, we are looking for strategic partners to, um, to get involved uh, in the company in terms of um, providing some uh, uh, capital support moving forwards. And we're also looking for licensing partners who have those deep uh, B2B relationships where they can uh, distribute our tests across a much wider uh, range of, of uh, opportunities. So I thank you for your attendance and I thank you for your interest in, in the company. And uh, I hope that um, this is a, a long and uh, prosperous journey for all of us and uh, stay healthy. Thank you, Peter. For more information on genetic technologies, reach us at 1-800-REDSHIP. That's 1-800-733-2447 or email us at gene at redshift.com. Please visit the information page created by Redship for genetic technologies. It's genetechinfo.com. There you can view and download the investor presentation and fact sheet and sign up for news alerts on genetic technologies. Please be sure to watch Small Stocks Big Money, Redship's program featuring exciting small cap companies every Saturday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg USA. Join Redship's forthcoming webinars, Nova Minerals, on Monday, October 7th, 1606 Corp. on Thursday, October 10th, and Alliance Entertainment Holding on Tuesday, October 15th. All three of those webinars will start at 4.15 p.m. U.S. Eastern. Register for those events and for all Redship webinars at redship.com slash events, where you can also view an archived version of today's webinar. Thanks again to our many participants today. And as always, thank you, Peter and the team.